Genesis 34. We're coming very close to the end of the course. You realize that? There's been no interruptions because of COVID. That's also Raga becoming attached to the course. You're seven day coming here every week. <laughs> okay. We continue with the philosophy of the Kleshas based on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Chapter 2, Sutra 9 describes the last Klesha. Abhinivesha is the strong desire for life which dominates even the learned or the wise. Fear. Everything that is there to be said about fear, I kind of did at the end of uh, the previous lecture. How to deal with it, with the bungee jump and what have you, using anger as a fuel. Patanjali is giving us a little support here. Because of ego, we don't like imperfections. Because of ego, we don't like failures because of ego. We don't want to be weak. But what he says here is fear. Abhinivesha. It's the strong desire for life which everybody suffers from regardless of who you are, where you are, how rich you are, how smart you are, how well educated you are, it dominates everybody's life. And it does. It's so dominant that we don't even realize that it's behind every thought, feeling, decision that we, that we go through uh, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. For us, becoming more conscious and sensitive, it becomes more and more inevitable. But it is important that you consciously start paying attention to it. Start playing with it. Whenever you feel obstructed, whenever you feel hampered, whenever you feel frustrated, investigate. Always you will find an element of fear involved. Overcoming fear, being courageous, does not mean taking stupid risks. Do not let fear paralyze you, but also be aware of possible risk. After all, the function of fear is to warn us, to warn us of potential danger. So, fear is not useless, not something that should just be dismissed. But then why is it such a big issue? Because fear is our deepest animal instinct, our deepest primordial instinct of survival. It's so strong, so dominant, that it kicks in all the time, very often without a valid reason. Most 
most of the times when fear kicks in, it's invalid. There is no danger other than what we fantasize, what we imagine. Many people are conditioned to fear, to be afraid. Just look how parents often brace their kids, constantly warning them, be careful with this, be careful with that, it's dangerous, don't do it. And children start to see the world from that perspective because they become conditioned like that. Of course, the dilemma is we have to raise our children safely and prevent them from harm, from danger. But just like everything else in yoga, we have to do effort to do that in the right way. Instead of just constantly saying, don't do this, don't do that, it's dangerous this, it's dangerous that. Understand that children need to discover life, need to discover the world. And even more than us adults, they learn by making mistakes. So you guard over your children, but you try to keep a certain distance from them so they can, without any indoctrinate, without any influence on the way that they act and react, they can spontaneously uh, discover the world and grow as a result of that. Grow and develop as a result of that into wise and mature Adults. Play with fear. Play with fear and when the fear is too strong and playing doesn't help, you throw in the next element, anger. You put your foot down. You ridicule, you, you ridicule yourself. You mock yourself for allowing yourself to be paralyzed by that fear. When you do that, you will put your foot down and you'll say, oh, wait a minute, I will show you something. <laughs> That's how it works. To give you an example of fear, how disastrous it can be, When there is a fire in a building, especially if it's a place where there are many people, like a, a stadium, a cinema, a discotheque, a nightclub, it happens frequently, if you pay attention in the news, somewhere in the world, in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, in North America, fire occurs or just smoke and people die. Now if you read carefully the accompanying text, you see that people didn't die from the flames. They often didn't die from the fire, nor from the smoke, but they die because people panic. Many people in a space, something happens that shocks them. Everybody at the same time wants to go to the exit. 1,500 people wanting to go to the exit at the same time. Many people get trampled, trampled to death or immobilized and then they will succumb to the smoke. Hardly ever it's the flames that kill people. It's the panic that kills people. 
There are very few people that are panic resistant, that stay calm under such circumstances. You will develop this quality. You will. You will anticipate potential danger wherever you go because that is part of your increasing sensitivity and consciousness. Whenever you enter into a venue which is limited in space and where you know there are going to be many people, you will already look around and anticipate what to do in case something might happen. It may never happen, but you will anticipate. You will prepare. And the moment that something happens, you're ready. And you will look around and you will see all those people going crazy, out of control, and you keep distance. And you just see, where should I go? I should go there, but there are too many people. It's all it's exploding there. Those people are trampling each other. So you know that you don't, you shouldn't. Or you should go there through with a deviation or to avoid the, 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 the melee, the, the, the people going crazy in their panic. You will be one of the few people surviving these kind of things simply because you keep oversight. It's also how you recognize really spiritual people. There are many people who pretend. And then at the slightest thing happening, they panic, they scream, they shoot into some kind of cramp that they cannot control. That shows that they're still controlled, dominated by their lower chakras, not by the crown chakra. Sutra 10, how do we get rid of the kleshas? These, the subtle ones, can, we, can be reduced by resolving them backward into their origin. The origin of the kleshas, the origin of fear is anger. The origin of anger is attachment. The origin of attachment is ego. The origin of ego is ignorance. So, how do you get rid of kleshas? By bringing them back to ignorance, turning ignorance into wisdom, insight. You become conscious, you become aware. It's all about that. And of course, putting in the work, because it doesn't just come falling out of the sky. We have to actually start paying attention. Apart from our uh, discipline to practice yoga, which provides us with the increased consciousness, We have to pay attention. And like I said in the previous uh, lecture, every time we don't pay attention, we get hit much more than before we became more conscious, or much more than other or normal people. And when that happens, let that be an incentive, let that be a, a stimulation that makes you promise to start paying attention again. Because we simply must pay attention to avoid misery. When we are ignorant, misery happens and because our lack of insight and consciousness we do not see where it came from we just think life 
is misery. I just have to accept it as it is. It's unavoidable. When we become more conscious, we start to see the law of cause and effect at work. So, from an ignorant state where you're not able to see why misery occurs, you now develop the ability to trace it back to what happened that caused the misery. The next step is that you anticipate misery. So first, you don't even see where it's coming from. The next step is that you, that you learn to trace it back. So after it happened, after it hit you, you will be able to, to reflect on what happened, why it happened, how it happened. And based on experience and increasing insight, you will get to the point where misery is in the making, the energy is starting to whirl the fittis in you, you become aware of the samskara being triggered, the icon in your hard disk is clicked with the cursor, but before it manifests, because you were able to see the process, you were able to anticipate what follows out of the trigger. You can abort it. You can avoid it before it actually happened. And that we call karma yoga. And karma yoga, make no mistake about it, it's the highest stage of yoga. It's the stage where you avoid misery overall. Misery still happens, the world around us is dynamic and full of uh, 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 negative and positive vibrations. But the difference now is that you have so much experience and consciousness that you detect it for it has actually manifested and that will give you the power to overall avoid it of course it's not perfect you will sometimes be too late then you can still limit the damage You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Why is it called karma yoga at that stage? Because you avoid making new karma. Not only have you burned karma from the past, but you stop making new karma in the future, or at least very low level. And there's also something like good karma. So you become more selective. Things that seem harmful, negative, hurtful, you will avoid. But things that seem positive, auspicious, constructive, part of the path that you are on, you allow those to manifest. That is the master of the universe, as Patanjali calls it. The master of the universe is not somebody sitting on a magic carpet flying through space, as symbolically pictured in ancient uh, uh, art. It's just symbolism. True master of the universe is the yogi that controls karma, at least to a relatively high extent. And because of self-study, you're very aware of 
the karma that you are still carrying with you, your deepest karma, that I called the redwoods or the sequoias in the past. After you have cleared out the whole forest of all the weeds, the brush, and the small trees, only three, four, five huge redwoods remain. That is your essential karma. And that is also where your weak spot lies, if you don't pay attention. Sutra 11. Their active modifications are to be suppressed by meditation. Active modifications are the manifestation of the kleshas. Consciousness is fueled by meditation, is awakened by meditation. The silver lining in all of yoga, with all the various exercises, is in fact to not only awaken but fuel or even supercharge consciousness. And you do that by meditation. And everything you do, from the study of the yamas and the niyamas, asana practice, pranayama, mudras, meditation in itself, building up meditation, it's all designed to perfect consciousness, to deepen consciousness inside. I'm always a little bit amused when people put posts on Facebook and say we offer yoga and meditation. It's a total contradiction in terminus. Yoga and meditation shows that the person offering the practice doesn't know what they're talking about. Because yoga is meditation, meditation is yoga. They cannot be separated, although with the modern approach to yoga, which is purely physical and not at all sattvic, it shouldn't even be called yoga. One of my biggest struggles in my 20s, 30s, was I knew, I needed to sit down and meditate more often, more regularly. I came from a tumultuous childhood and youth that killed my brothers because I found yoga I turned into another direction and basically I rescued myself in that way but things don't change overnight a human being doesn't change overnight. The reason that you are born in that situation where there is so much uh, karma, conflict, chaos, that is because you have a big backpack full of karma with you. So when you start practicing yoga and you, you feel so great, you think all my problems are gone. Now I can conquer the world. And you can and you will, but you find yourself again and again being drawn back into the past, being confronted with the same misery. And that is a process 
that takes a lot of time, a lot of failure, but always getting back onto the track. And it's a process of two steps forward, one step back. And you simply have to accept that you have to go through that if you want to change your life permanently. And it took me 30 years, 40 years, I'm still working on it. But that's okay, because life starts making sense. It's very valuable to realize that you actually did take your destiny into your own hands. And when you're young and inexperienced and you feel so great because of your yoga practice in the beginning, you become a little bit overconfident, a little bit cocky, and you think, we will take care of this, if this feels so good, everything, it's already taken care of. But you will find out again and again, it's not that simple, it's not that easy. You really have to work, you have to stay on top of things, and most important, I always, when I ended up in trouble, my conclusion was, I need to sit down and meditate. Because when I meditate, the activity, the consciousness in the crown chakra, overseeing the perceived problems, perceived problems, when you oversee that, the problems don't exist. Because you have a grip on them, because you understand them, because you know what to do to not fall into that trap. But you switch back to normal daily life, you still have a regular job or education. Most of your life just exists out of uh, uh, everything that you did before yoga, and it's so easy to fall back. Two major conclusions, always throughout all those years, were sit down more and meditate more. For me, being a yoga teacher, that is the perfect way to dealing with that lack of discipline. Because when you teach, you get to practice yourself too. And you get paid for it too. But the other thing that I again and again realized was I need to be more independent. Every time I ended up in trouble, I realized I need to be more independent not needing anybody. It sounds a little bit sad, but <laughs> if you end up in relationships because you need people, it's not pure and it's not unconditional. You can you guarantee that you are going to have trouble, conflict. All relationships are like that, almost all. Now, when you are completely independent, not needing anybody for anything, well, that's the ideal, you'll never completely be 100%. But if you're to a very large extent independent, your choice of relationship will also be much purer. Because it is not influenced by muladhara chakra, by fear, by need. As long as you cannot, you will have to confront more suffering, more misery. Meditation, really, make some time for it. Or start teaching yoga. Sutra 12. The reservoir of karmas, which are rooted in pleasures, brings all kinds of experiences in the present and future lives. We are all universal beings. We are all, in our origin, from the same source. What Patanjali is suggesting here you know, I mentioned a couple of times that in Buddhism, 
It is believed that we need to live through one million reincarnations, one million rebirths, to burn all our karma. So this, this one life that we are now in is just one out of, there is another 999, 999 left. 999,999 left. The karma that you are dealing with in this life, that's only a very small portion of the total karma that you possess. But you know, if you are a little bit familiar in uh, spiritual circles, that people speak of old souls and young souls. Have you heard that? Old souls are people who have spent a lot of those one million lives already, enabling them to get rid of a lot of their existing karma. Young souls, you recognize by their ignorance, by their innocence, naivety, they're still somewhere at the beginning stages of going through all those lives and getting rid of that huge amount of karma. What it is telling us is that every one of those one million lives you spend to burn a certain aspect of your karma but there is a huge amount left the purpose of yoga and any other serious spiritual practice is to give you a shortcut because the reason why we need one million lives to burn that karma is ignorance lack of understanding, lack of consciousness. So people keep making the same mistake again and again. Not only in this life, they continue making the same mistake in the next. You became a yoga practitioner, maybe out of sheer misery or out of other interest, Regardless, you become conscious, you start investigating yourself naturally, you start making the link, seeing the law of cause and effect at work, and that allows you to make a huge leap forward in burning all that karma. I cannot tell you how many lives you skip in this life as a result of yoga. There, is, there are no statistics for that, but it's very clear that to see the process that is at work. If you look at my brothers who ended up destroying themselves with alcohol and drugs, they really haven't made much progress in this life. They will be born in another life of misery because they haven't solved anything of it in this life. Instead of solving it or trying to solve it, they just drowned in it, helpless, lacking the insight to see what is happening with them and what they need to do to, to burn that karma. If I compare that with my life and I see all those stages that I went through, I can see easily that, that yoga, consciousness, from yoga or other spiritual practice, it gives you a shortcut. Because as opposed to untrained people, you deal with a huge amount of karma in only this life alone that otherwise would take multiple lives. If you see 
with all our education and smarts that we think we have, most people are actually quite dumb, continuing to repeat the same mistake again and again. And when I say quite dumb, it sounds a little bit negative, but that is just, that is just human nature. We can be very smart, well-educated, while lacking consciousness. So that is, this is what the philosophy of the Kleshas is about. Developing this insight. You started practicing yoga, your consciousness is changing, then you study this and every time you say, wow, yeah, indeed, now I can see how this works. And you start seeing how it applies in your daily life situations, at work, at home, and where have you. But you will also see that you will make mistakes. And when that happens, I hope that you will not drown yourself in, in regret or guilt or self-pity, but that you simply see the process. Two steps forward, progress, one step back. And that you appreciate the one step back for what it is. Because without the step back, you don't learn. So you don't grow. The two steps forward are enabled by the, back, the, 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 the step back. That is why sometimes we fall asleep. Kind of. Because for a while we don't make mistakes. We don't have a step back. And that's comfortable. That's nice. And you can start to enjoy a little bit of that comfort. But then you get hit. That is the one step back. You draw some conclusions, you learn something new or something old. Sometimes you have to reinvent the wheel. That's also human nature. I always have a feeling I'm reinventing the wheel. Still. <laughs> But the only way to go forward is to once in a while have a setback. Because it's the failure that teaches, that makes the foundation for you to make another two steps forward. Can you see the process? Yeah. So instead of thinking negatively about it, about making mistakes, about failure, I have learned to appreciate it. I have learned to be grateful to learn from it. And in that way, you change your life and your outlook on life. Because suffering is caused by ego. Then suffering, if it is used in a positive and constructive way to learn something from, allowing us to move forward, there's nothing wrong with that, is it? Yes, there is the temporary instability and maybe temporary uh, suffering, pain. But you know that it has a positive function. And once you start seeing that, your suffering in life will totally change. Instead of being a victim, which is what we normally do, because we don't understand the suffering, instead of being a victim, we simply learn from it and grow. When you see that, it's not difficult to appreciate the misery. It's not difficult to appreciate mistakes we make. It's ego that is always standing in the way of this. I hope you see that too. Nobody likes to make mistakes. Worse, to admit them until you understand that they have a very positive, constructive function. Until you are able to not allow ego to spoil the fun or to disturb the process. Questions?
Okay, let's have a short break then.